The name of the project I'm going to talk about today is uh, an ecosystem of excess, which also gives uh, this exhibition its name. And um, after the talk, you'll be seeing an animation. I you know, recommend you to go read uh, the drawings. Those, those are more like uh, almost scientific dissections, etc. And the sculptures are there. So. Um, the, I was really interested in this notion of excess, uh, especially after I moved to the States in, in 2006. I got really, really interested in this notion of excess waste accumulation, um, excessive consumption, uh, excessive uh, consumerism. So um, this ecosystem of excess was born actually um, in this intersection of uh, excessive consumerism, excessive consumption, which is linked to capitalism, etc., etc., and excesses of nature. Uh, there's an amazing philosopher, Elizabeth Grosch, and that guy doesn't belong to me, uh, sorry, who um, talks about excesses in nature um, as um, basically um, the, the main thing that defines our notion of beauty and the main thing that uh, attracts us. So she says nature creates excesses to, let's say, you know, um, a flower becomes a flower to attract the bee, and like the smell, the, uh, the colors are excesses, or uh, a deer has these beautiful horns, and that's an excess, because it actually jeopardizes survival sometimes, etc., etc. But then again, we're drawn to these excesses. So there's a connection between excess and beauty too. But then again, there's like the dark side of excess, um, which is waste. So another thing I was thinking about was man-made extreme environments or sites of excess. And um, it's very easy to see, find them actually. Uh, for me, just the shopping mall was a site of excess. Um, an oil spill, uh, most recently BP oil spill. Um, a multi-story parking lot, and the open ocean, like one of the you know uh, least likely places to be a man-made extreme environment. So the site I chose is this, this is the coordinates, and um, it's called North uh, Pacific Subtropical Gyre, also known as uh, the Pacific Trash Vortex. Have you heard of this before? Who heard? Of, who didn't hear? I mean, like this is silly, but. Two people heard it, so maybe I'll give you some more information. So this is basically uh, the site, and um, there are five gyres in the ocean. And what happens is plastic waste, any kind of waste. I don't know if you can see these dots clearly. You can accumulates in these gyres over time. So since the introduction of plastics as you know disposable consumer goods in our lives in like 50s, even like uh, 40s. So um, this was a site, and since 19, there's like, they found plastic waste in the site uh, from 1945. The thing is, plastic waste keeps, you know, accumulating, and it goes here. And then uh, in 1997, um, this captain, which I'm going to show his face very soon, uh, Charles Moore, uh, discovers this place. I mean, it's of course there, but he discovers the plastic waste problem. He uh, you know, on his way back from Hawaii, he takes a different route and he's going like this. And then he sees like all these plastic particles floating in the ocean. And he's like, what is this? He starts thinking about this, goes back, takes samples and realizes that a vast, a really big portion of the ocean is uh, contaminated with plastic waste. So this is 1997, of course, year 2014. There's more plastic uh, in the ocean now. but. Um, Pacific trash vortex is not the only site where plastic pollution is a problem. Uh, all the gyres have this. But I picked this one also because of this picture that I uh, found. Um, this is by a photographer, Chris Jordan. And to me, this image is like the, um, um, it's, it's like the ultimate kind of fusion of nature and culture, right? It's where organic meets uh, synthetic, or synthetic meets organic. And uh, this is a laser now that draws. And uh, there's an island in the middle of uh, um, this gyre called Midway. And this island happens to be like the, um, what's the word for it? Like it's, it's like where albatrosses go to you know, mate and lay their eggs. 
And uh, photographer Chris Jordan uh, went there, and now he's you know about to release this documentary called Midway, and um, documented all these albatross chicks and you know adult albatrosses uh, dying, suffering this lingering death after inge ingesting plastics. Um, you know another uh, image of negative sub sublime. This is from BP oil spill. And of course, the oil spill, oil in the scene, plastics are like really, really uh, tightly connected. And uh, war between polymers. Um, this, again, uh, you know, it's, it's an image that blows my mind because this is a six pack vein, and um, uh, it's usually, I think this is poly HDP, I'm not sure. So, this is a synthetic polymer, and this is keratin, which is also like our hair, you know, nails, etc. And here you see like this tug of war between polymers, but life wins, life adopts. Of course, this turtle has a lot of digestive problems because of like this squished uh, digestive tract. But um, so yeah, I was you know looking at a lot of um, images like this. If I can play this video, I will be very happy. Uh, plastic ingestion is not only a problem for uh, birds and sea turtles. This is a whale and um, just last year more than a dozen whales beached out uh, and they uh, dying because of plastic ingestion. Yeah, maybe it's better without the sound because there's this really cheesy, sad soundtrack to it. But th this, these are the last moments of this whale dying and um, after the whale uh, is gone, they uh, dissect. It's um, you know, abdominal area, and they find, um, I think, 18 or maybe like 80 kilograms of plastics. So I, you know, started thinking about this pelagic death, this distant death, and how plastics is, um, you know, um, kind of uh, killing uh, or, you know, affecting um, sea life there. It's, um, it's also uh, an invisible death because we don't really like see this every day. And the numbers are really grave, by the way. It's not that like one whale dies per year or something. The numbers keep increasing. And um, then, uh, again, um, I came across this footage of Captain Charles Moore. Here you can see him. He's holding a sample from the ocean. And he goes, um, the oceans have turned into plastic soup. This is the soup. And at that moment, um, I started thinking about like the more historical ancient role of oceans as the wombs of life. Because uh, according to the primordial soup theory, four million years ago, billion years ago, uh, life starts in the oceans. And uh, today, in our contemporary oceans, uh, there's more plastic than plankton. There's like 46 pieces of plastics per uh, plankton. And um, the ecosystem of excess was born once I asked this question, what if life started now in today's oceans in our contemporary primordial soup of plastics? So from this point on, all the you know, uh, images I'll show you are from um, the exhibition and from uh, the, uh, they're all like different you know, organisms or organs that are part of this ecosystem. So um, this is the soup exhibition starts with the soup, the plastic soup, and um, in, uh, if, you can ever, if you ever go to Berlin, you can see this one here. Uh, we made a soup uh, where um, the ingredients were basically, uh, this is the soup, uh, every plastic item you touch once you uh, start your day. Uh, so it's like stuff that you touch uh, basically in the morning. I guess this is just the morning recipe. It's the plastic soup morning recipe. So this is the first um, item in the exhibition. Then comes the plastosphere bacteria. So um, again, while doing research on the subject, I came across a lot of papers and a lot of news, or, uh, news articles um, there are people that claim, or there are people who found fungi or bacteria that can decompose plastics. Because one thing about plastics is that it doesn't <coughs> uh, really go away, it's eternal. Uh, it photodegrades, but it's 
not you know uh, broken down uh, like other uh, organic materials. But there are research groups that claim that they can you know design bacteria that will uh, help us with our plastic waste problem. So I was reading about that, but then I found the work of. Uh, Linda Emerald Zettler and Eric Zettler and Chase Mincer and I got in touch with them and um, this research group based in um, Woods Hole uh, Oceanographic Institution found bacteria not designed by human beings actually living in plastic waste uh, in uh, Saragossa Sea. So we had Skype meetings etc. We started a correspondence <coughs> and um, this is the paper they published in July this year and then they sent me all these like uh, SEM images of the bacteria. So I'll show you some. And they were like, well, Pnar, we don't really know what this bacteria is doing, but they're there. And it's a huge community of microbial species. Therefore, we call it the plastosphere, just like the cryosphere or ionosphere. And I was like, OK, for my ecosystem, I don't have to design it. <coughs> it's already there. So I took that. The other group. I designed was uh, or focused on was insects and crustaceans, and um, again, starting with a paper that I found, um, I realized that the plastic ocean can be an amazing place for aquatic insects. Currently, in our open oceans, there aren't many insects because uh, in the open ocean, insects can't lay eggs. But um, this really cool 17-year-old, um, maybe she's 21 right now, Miriam Goldstein, did this research where she looked at uh, you know, uh, the insect egg numbers from 1960s on. And she showed this positive correlation between the numbers of insect eggs and microplastics or plastic particles in the ocean. She says that because of the plastic pollution, insects now have this place to lay their eggs on. So I designed a group of insects um, for the plastosphere. Here you can see some of them. And um, yeah, the next concept was the nurdle beach. Nurdles are, it's a term um, that defines uh, pre-production plastic pellets. So these and these, these are from my show. These are like real nurdles. Um, nurdles are basically the building blocks of plastics. Anything that's you know, made out of plastic was once upon a time a nurdle, a pellet like this. But um, I think 113 million tons are produced per year, so it's a crazy number. But then um, some of it escapes the corporate borders of these you know, uh, plastic production uh, facilities and ends up in the beaches. So nurdles are the, also called mermaid's tears, are the number one beach contaminant. So in the ecosystem of excess though, um, Mermaid's tears aren't tears of sorrow, but they're tears of joy, where nurdles become the grains of sand. <coughs> Therefore, I started thinking about reptilia and enigmatic taxa that would you know, live on this beach. And um, ladies and gentlemen, this is Pacific balloon turtle, one of my favorite creatures. So again, while doing research, I found two papers. One of them was talking about a very funny, weird, uh, type of pollution, balloon pollution. You wouldn't believe that, but apparently, especially in the west coast of the states, balloon pollution is a big problem because people love celebrating their joy, weddings, etc., by releasing balloons up in the air. But then what happens to those balloons? They go land in the ocean and into the digestive tract of turtles because this second study shows that marine turtles prefer um, colored, colorful plastics and colorful latex, colorful rubber, that's, you know, the balloon material, to clear plastics. So if you give a hungry turtle clear plastics and balloons, they would go for the balloon. And I was like, okay, after eating this much balloon, and one third of every um, marine turtle dies because of eating plastics. I was like, after years and decades and eons of eating balloons, maybe they'll evolve this elastic bag. So this is actually a really advantageous thing to have for the plastic balloon turtle. It, it inflates, it becomes like a fitness indicator, it becomes like a sexual selection thing. If you have like a really inflatable big back, then, uh, back, then you're like 
uh, as a turtle <coughs> more attractive. Also, I was thinking about climate change and the rise of the sea levels. I was like, poor turtles will have to swim longer distances. Maybe they can use the inflatable um, back as like a air mattress to rest <laughs> when they get exhausted. <coughs> so uh, that's the Pacific balloon turtle, also known as Globus <coughs> aerostaticus. This is an enigmatic taxa. Uh, it's like a PVC polyvinyl chloride shell. And we think that it's uh, a sea worm that's making the shell, but then there's a, a crab-like creature that dwells in it. It's not very really clear the, the symbiotic relationship between them. Uh, these are transchromic eggs of a benthic reptile. Benthic means the bottom of the sea. So 60% of plastic pollution sinks. So the bottom of the ocean is actually really, really polluted. And this benthic reptile lays its eggs in the bottom of the sea, which is rich in plastic, so it's good for the ecosystem of excess. And what happens is, um, once it lays its eggs down there, um, because you know it's very dark there, and because the only color that will help your survival is red, because you know red uh, uh, is a color that's preferred uh, by many marine deep sea creatures, the eggs are red. But then, after a while, the eggs grow a little bit and they start floating, and they go to the, uh, they end up at the Nurdle Beach and then they transform uh, to white. I won't be able to see you movie, but if you go to the exhibition, at least for three, two weeks, maybe two days, the color <laughs> transformation was working, but then my mechanism failed. But anyways, um, the other species that I was thinking about was birds. Here is uh, Pantoni. Are you all familiar with Pantoni <coughs> designers? Yeah. So uh, this is a color management system which also defines industrial color as we know it. And every single corporation, every single, let's say, a beverage corporation that creates bottle caps will have to define their color using Pantone. So Pantone 485C is one of the many Coca-Cola reds, for instance. So this got me thinking. I was like, okay, just like <coughs> turtles prefer balloons, Birds, marine birds, prefer bottle caps. The, the most common item in their digestive tra tract is bottle caps and lighters. So um, I was like, okay, well, okay, after eating like so many, so many Coca-Cola caps, uh, getting all that Coca-Cola red in them, maybe their feathers will change. So I was basically thinking about flamingos who get their amazing, beautiful orange color from the, shrimp, um, the uh, krill that they eat. And I was like, after eating, you know, um, let's say Sprite Green or I don't know what's the orange drink that Coca-Cola makes, Fanta bottles, etc. Maybe they'll you know attain these colors. So um, these are corporate colors attained by the ecosystem of excess birds. And uh, the last one, the last set is organs for sensing and metabolizing plastics. Because if you Challenge yourself with designing an ecosystem like I did. There are two things you have to think about. Number one, what's my energy source? Uh, how do I metabolize it? Number two, how do I find my energy source? What, what, what's my sensorium like? So um, this is a plastoceptor, P plastoceptor. It's a plastosensory organ that detects plastics. Um, it uh, kind of looks like a P, the top part that's why, where, it, where it gets its name, and this organ is specialized also on polypropylene, which is the second most common plastics uh, in the ocean. This is an e plastoceptor We have an e plastoceptor back in those jars. So they come in many different forms, but um, e plastoceptors are uh, specialized on polyethylene, which is like the most common plastics, and some of them work like a spectrograph, so they are like kind of uh, detect the radiations that molecules uh, make because these are receptors that detect, you know, uh, chains. So it's not like detecting light. It's a much more complicated process. Not that detecting light is easy, but anyways, you get the idea. So Maximus, and we have a, a sample here, is a digestive organ for the plast war. And Stomaximus is amazing because if you're, you know, uh, trying to survive in plastosphere, and if you're a plastivore, which means just like a carnivore eats meat, or a herbivore eats plants, you eat plastics, then you have to be able to digest it. And then with this, uh, you know, organ, you have all these tiny little 
chambers that contain different types of bacteria. And this bacteria will help you digest um, polyvinyl tetraphytylates, polyethylene, polypropylene, polyurethane, vinyl, acrylic, nylon, you name it. So the, the, the chambers um, would be doing, doing the digestion for you. Petronephros is a kidney for the plastivore. So okay, we broke down plastics, we got the energy, but there are a lot of additives and plasticizers in plastics. This is real. When plastics um, break down, uh, it releases all these additives and plasticizers back into the ocean. And this gets absorbed by um, fat tissues and the blood of, these, uh, of the organisms, including us humans. We all have plasticizers and additives in our bloodstream. This is proven by scientific study. And what petronephros does is, it filters out uh, bisphenol A phytylates and all kinds of um, really, really horrible, really, really toxic, um, you know, um, molecules of death that um, no ecosystem can actually deal with. So, um, and this last one is the petroventricular system. It's the digestive system for the marine birds. Uh, this is um, a snapshot of the exhibition at Schering Stiftung in Berlin. The project was also an attempt to um, think about an ecosystem without us and uh, think about this molecular violence that we're um, applying, exerting on um, non-human organisms. And um, it was also kind of for me an exercise about, uh, exercise about um, on um, science and how science can become abusive and um, the certain um, defects or uh, evolutionary flaws we have, such as future blindness. We can't see the future. And um, this is like the motto of environmentalism. This is what some people propose instead, and I agree, just refuse everything. And uh, I want to end with a quote by Rachel Carson who is, I guess, like one of the pioneers of environmental movement uh, in the States at least. Uh, why should we tolerate a diet of weak poisons? And um, a plastic-filled environment is nothing but a diet of weak poisons. So on that sweet note, I'm going to ask Tatiana to come and talk about um, Transmediale and Afterglow. Okay.